whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, hold up, hold up a minute, hold up a minute. Before we kick off this new episode, I want to make something crystal clear to you from the get-go. Okay, let me show you something. I've been using this notebook to brainstorm ideas for Engage for a long time. And when I was getting to the point of being able to organize those ideas together to create some kind of schedule with that original production goal that I had for the show to produce one new episode per month, I kid you not, I had scheduled this episode on the game Pandemic to follow the episode on the game Hanabi since both are cooperative games, which meant in the original plan, this episode was intended to air in March, as in March 2019. Obviously, I'm behind in meeting that original production goal, and I've revised my goals for the show since. But you can imagine how that really creeps me out to come back to my notes here as I was starting to write and get ready to shoot this episode. I mean, chills. I could not, I could not tell you how much I wish, coincidentally predicting the future here, how wrong I wish I could be right now. In any case, we are going to take a sobering look today at the game pandemic to discuss how it can be leveraged to facilitate game-based learning in your classroom, because frankly, there could not be a more appropriate time to discuss what this game is all about. And before we get into it, I have to say, I hope that you and your circle of friends and your family and your community at large, if you're watching this at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic, are all staying healthy and safe. Of course, I cannot express my gratitude enough to all the medical professionals out there on the front lines fighting to keep us safe during this difficult time. I also can't express enough gratitude to all the unsung heroes out there, from the grocery store workers, to the pharmacy workers, to the post office workers, to all the artists and musicians and spiritual leaders who are doing their absolute best to try and help get us through this absolutely difficult time. Thank you so much for all you do. And please send virtual hugs to all the teachers out there who are doing the very best they can to help parents help their kids and teens get through this crisis with some kind of sense of normalcy, especially to the educators out there who may not have a job to come back to in the fall of the next school year due to budget cuts and the like. All right, I've said my piece. Go ahead and roll the, uh, roll the intro, would you? This episode of Engage has been sanitized for your protection. What's up everybody, Jeremy here and welcome to another episode of Engage, where learning through play is the name of the game. Whether you're face to face in the classroom or making do with whatever you can via distance learning. Now, my original plan before life got so serious was to kick this episode off with an absolutely hilarious cold open intended to be an homage to Beekman's World, another classic 90s edutainment program starring an eccentric but lovable character who tried to make learning about science exciting for kids that actually predated everybody's favorite science guy by nearly a full year. In Beekman's World, the show usually started off with a healthy dose of meta humor way before that kind of humor was cool by having a couple of fried Frosty Penguins previewing the episode you are about to see on their snow-covered TV screen. Much like Statler and Waldorf from The Muppets, the Penguins were sharp, dry, and sardonic critics of the show, and they would poke fun at Beekman and his band of mad science misfits and how far they pushed themselves to try and make kids interested in learning this stuff. So my original thought for the cold open for this episode of Engage was not only to have a tip of the old hat to Beekman's world, but also to poke fun at the fact that I'd once again be launching into a discussion about another excellent game that, much like Hanabi in the previous episode of Engage, is, you guessed it, a superb test of communication and collaboration skills. Communication and collaboration. 
both oh, are come on. Didn't they do this bit already? Heh, <laughs> you act like I watched the show. Educators okay, real cute there, buddy. But seriously, you should subscribe to this show. It's quite good. As I was saying, having strong communication and collaboration skills is no joke in this game. Because in this game, you are dealing with a crisis. Why, your lack of crafting skills for making puppets? <laughs> no, but very funny. No, in this game, you're dealing with a real crisis. In fact, you and your team are dealing with a full-blown pandemic. Dun, dun, dun. Blimey, I didn't even have eyes, and I could see that build-up was unnecessary. <laughs> Now, under ordinary circumstances, I personally prefer to play games that put you into an adventure or into some kind of silly situation that aren't the most realistic. But then there are times like this, like the timing of the recording of this episode, where we need the kinds of games that provide you with a way to confront harsh realities and find some kind of hope in the darkest of timelines. That's one huge reason why superhero movies are so popular these days. But while we unfortunately don't have the likes of The Incredible Hulk or Wonder Woman in real life, we do have real heroes in this world. And in this game, you get to be some of those heroes. In the game Pandemic, masterfully designed by Matt Leacock and debuting in 2008, you and your friends assemble to form a superhero team of healthcare professionals, researchers, and scientists, tasked with the solemn responsibility to save the world from the outbreaks of highly contagious diseases like COVID-19. Together, you must pull out all the stops to contain the spread of disease as much as possible to administer whatever treatments are available to help those who have fallen victim to the disease, and to work around the clock toward the development of a cure. It might surprise you to learn that cooperative games in which you work together with your fellow players in order to achieve a common goal have become nearly as ubiquitous as competitive games in the past decade or so. There are frankly oodles of cooperative games out there like Hanabi that position you and your teammates on equal footing. And then there are cooperative games out there like Pandemic that require each player to take on a specific role, each with its own unique set of great powers. And naturally, with those great powers come great responsibilities. Choose your character! The point here is that each specialist's role and responsibilities are clearly defined, which makes it easy for each member of the team to identify and to respect each teammate's strengths. I highlight this point because as educators, whenever we ask students to work together on a collaborative class project, providing an easily accessible framework for distinct roles and responsibilities like this is often a key element that falls by the wayside. And that's not a criticism, mind you, but an honest acknowledgement as an educator that sometimes it's just hard to come up with this kind of framework. Believe me, I know. We are already spending tons of time trying to come up with an engaging project in the first place for your students to get excited about and really take something meaningful from. And on top of that, you're working out all the logistics of how the project is going to pan out over time. So to layer on top of that, also coming up with the framework of distinct roles and responsibilities for each member of a student team to take on, it's just another layer of complexity on top of everything else to figure out how to work out. That's why bringing cooperative games like Pandemic that center their mechanics around having such distinct roles and responsibilities that are so well defined for players to take on and experiment with is so helpful. All you need is some inspiration for how to construct a role based upon even a little yet significant detail that separates one role from the next. And Pandemic does that beautifully because it keeps those little details simple. Designing projects with distinct roles and responsibilities in mind is to design opportunities for learning with empathy. After all, many kids and teens and even fully grown adults are continually working through the process of trying to figure out what they're really good at doing. And so when thrust into a situation 
in which they're expected to collaborate effectively with others within a short time frame. Some may lack the foundation or reference point needed in order to just make that happen and hit the ground running. Therefore, the more opportunities that you can provide for structured collaboration, as well as to provide a safe space for that experimentation and iteration, the better. If you can carve out the time in your class to bring in a game like Pandemic and allocate multiple sessions so that your students have the opportunity for that experimentation with different predefined roles, go for it. Set that role play experimentation and the reflection to follow as the primary goal of the learning experience and make it clear to your students from the get-go that due to time constraints, they may not be able to see a full game each time all the way through to its completion. Afterwards, ask your students to compare and contrast the roles that they had the opportunity to experience and to draw connections between those roles to other roles that they take on during school and other roles that they take on outside of school elsewhere in their own time. For example, did it feel comfortable to step into the shoes of a role like the Dispatcher, where your primary focus was on strategically planning out pathways to help expedite the progress of your teammates? Or did it feel more natural for you to be the kind of person like the Medic, who is out there on the front lines, risking it all to face challenges head-on in order to buy time for your teammates to work out the big picture? Naturally, the very first session will be impacted by the learning curve of figuring out the game's rules and mechanics. So I I'd recommend scheduling at least three different short play sessions of the game to help compensate for that. In previous episodes of Engage, I have launched into a thorough explanation of how the rules and mechanics of the game we are discussing work, but thankfully, in the case of Pandemic, Rodney Smith of Watch It Played fame has got us covered. Check out the link to his walkthrough in the description below. Thanks, Rodney. Love your show. Glad I beat you to the punch on Hanabi, at least. So if we're keeping track of score at home, that's one for me and something like 11 billion to you. I mean, seriously, I've left total track of how many games you've taught us how to play over the years. Well done, sir. Well done. What I will say to my fellow educators out there is that in my experience thus far in bringing the game pandemic into the classroom, I've noticed that students sometimes forget to execute each and every phase that they're supposed to execute on a given player's turn. I've even used the game Pandemic with students as young as third grade, and for the most part, the experience was fantastic. But I distinctly remember that there was at least one group of students that told me that they crushed the game in no time at all. And that was because for a lot of players' turns, they forgot that phase where you're supposed to infect cities according to where the infection rate marker is at that point in the game. And so they forgot to draw those infection cards in order to determine what locations get infected after a player takes their turn. <sighs> but naturally, nobody likes the part where you have to figure out the infect city step, where you have to turn these cards over to find out which city gets infected next. But much like real life disease control efforts, we humans, we don't make the rules. We have to play by them. Now I know what you're thinking. Who on earth whips off prescription glasses like that? I mean, that's not a thing. Who does that? And you're absolutely right. But I'll tell you something else. I know what else you're thinking. What else could be learned from playing this game? Well, embedded in that opportunity to develop collaboration skills is the opportunity to learn more about systems thinking. A system, of course, is an organized set of parts that form together to form a unified whole usually with the intent to serve a common purpose. As one quick example, all the equipment I'm using to film this video is itself a system. We've got the camera that's got a lens that's capturing the visuals for the episode. And the camera itself is made up of all kinds of different parts, like the battery that's powering the camera in the first place, and the memory card which you have to put in to capture the data of the footage so that I can import it later into my computer. I've got a separate microphone to record the sound better than the camera would itself because my apartment is quite noisy and there's a lot of traffic going constantly outside. And the microphone has to be connected to the camera using a separate cable. Everything of course is on a tripod in order to keep the footage steady. And I have some additional lighting coming from the side that itself is powered by another battery and itself is standing on another tripod for stability. Even the natural light coming in from the window is part of the system that makes capturing this shot the way I want it to look possible. Because the natural light coming in from the windows is lighting up this side of my face. 
and the light from the artificial light source is lighting up the other side of my face and therefore balancing out so I don't end up with any weird shadows that I don't want. As the old saying goes, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so without all these parts working together as a system, filming this video would just not be possible. To turn our attention back to Pandemic, one key system we've already touched upon is our team of specialists. There is ample opportunity to analyze not only the attributes of each role taken individually, but then also to think critically about how each of these roles could interact with one another. If you ask your students ahead of time to make sure that they mix things up by making sure to have a different configuration of roles for each individual play session that they have the opportunity to engage with, then you can ask your students later to reflect on how each different combination affected their ability as a team to make progress in the game. For example, which roles are best to pair with one another in order to have the most productive synergy in the effort to stop viruses in their tracks? Which roles pair best for focusing on the development of a cure? And if such dream teams didn't materialize in your play sessions, how did the roles that you did have present compensate and make the best out of a tricky situation? These are all systems thinking inquiries that real life medical response teams are faced with and have to engage with, particularly when they're backed into a corner in a really desperate and difficult situation where they don't have each member of their team at their immediate disposal. Of course, this sort of systems thinking extends well beyond just examining the key players of the medical response team alone. I'd be willing to bet that when most people play a game of Pandemic, somebody at some point will see if they could take the action of building at least one additional research station. That's because in the game of Pandemic, having access to a research station is super important because these are the only locations you can go to in order to spend your research cards in order to create a cure for a disease. But they also enable you to take the action of shuttling a flight to travel instantly from one station to another that could be located all the way across the board. And anyone who has played this game knows how hard it is otherwise to make your way from point A to point B in order to keep up with the constant threat of diseases spreading across the globe, because you can only take up to four actions in one turn. Sure, there are other ways to move around the board more quickly, but those alternate methods of transportation require you to spend the very cards that represent the specimens you'd need in order to develop a cure for the four diseases wreaking havoc upon the world. Obviously, in real life, research stations for the CDC and the WHO don't have that Super Mario Bros. warp pipe functionality to be able to instantly transport scientists from one research station all the way to the other across the globe. Although that would be pretty awesome, right? But seriously, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Or no, scratch that. You don't have to be an epidemiologist to understand that having as many of these research stations strategically located across the globe is essential to maintaining public health and safety. I mean, guys, look, as I mentioned earlier, I've used this game as a teaching tool with perfectly intelligent third grade students and not once throughout the entire game or any other play sessions did I ever have to explain that having as many of these research stations available to them during the game would be smart and advantageous to them. Surely any fully grown adult like our public officials would be able to wrap their heads around that concept, right? Right? Oh, <sighs> uh, Yeah, I know. I'm sure you can see where I'm about to go with this. That's right, kids. It's time for me to get up on my soapbox. Join me, won't you? Now you see. Clearly, not a real soapbox. But did anyone ever actually own a soapbox in their homes? What a weird expression, right? Let's move on. You see, our system of education in recent decades, in America anyway, has become obsessed with STEAM, which is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, art, and math. There has been such a tremendous push for STEAM education, and those subjects are important to support, don't get me wrong, but somewhere along the way, we have lost sight of a more whole child or a more holistic approach to education that would prepare students to be active and independent and more well-rounded, more adaptable to be able to handle anything that may come their way. 
Somehow we have lost sight of how important the humanities are to this equation of providing a more holistic approach to education. And it's easy to see if you look at the healthcare crisis that we're dealing with at the time of making this episode, that STEAM education alone is not going to be enough to equip future generations with what they need in order to be able to navigate similar crises that may come up in the future. Using pandemic as a vehicle to engage students in a conversation about biology and pathology is pretty self-explanatory, as is its potential for making connections to math in terms of learning how to read and interpret data visualized in logarithmic scaling as opposed to linear scaling. But I have to argue, especially unfortunately given the COVID-19 crisis that we're dealing with at the time of making this episode, I have to argue that playing pandemic has a very important role to play in the humanities classroom as well. In fact, it might be even more important to play there. Math and science might be the tools we need to treat patients and synthesize medicines and vaccines, but for better or worse, it's politics that determines whether those tools are funded properly and put into motion responsibly. On top of that, communication and media literacy skill development absolutely comes into play here. Young people who seek to become researchers, scientists, doctors, journalists, elected officials, and so on will have to be prepared with the skill set to be able to determine what information is most essential for the public to know in order to stay safe. All the while projecting a strong sense of leadership, confidence, and calm. Meanwhile, the media literacy skill set from the perspective of the audience comes into play in terms of having the critical thinking skill set to be able to suss out what information out there can even be trusted. I hate to say it, but as I've approached almost finishing the editing of this episode that you're watching right now, a news story broke that speaks to this exact point I'm trying to make about how important media literacy is. So this chart was put out by the state of Georgia. It's an official piece of data released by the state of Georgia to justify their more aggressive approach to reopen business as usual. Of course, everybody wants to go back to life as normal before this whole pandemic wreaked havoc across America. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants life to go back to normal, but we have to do it in a delicate way. We have to do it in a scientifically smart way so that people don't get reinfected all over the place and the virus doesn't just reignite and have outbreaks all over again, right? We want to do this a mindful way. We want to do this a safe way. So they put out this data to justify, to show that, look at that, there is a decline in cases that are reported in the number of deaths and hospitalizations in major counties in the state of Georgia, right? This looks fantastic from a mathematical point of view. You're thinking, oh, wonderful. Everything is trending down, right? But you have to take a closer look and you have to read. Look at the bottom of this graph. The dates are not even in order. They manipulated the data to show what they wanted to show everyone, but it's not true. This is why media literacy education and the humanities are so important to support. This is why it's so important not just to fund STEAM programs, but also to properly fund reading programs in schools and the humanities and anything to do with media literacy. It is so important, especially now in this day and age where there's so much disinformation going out all over the place. You have to think about bias. You have to think about what is the purpose when somebody puts something like this out. Unfortunately, we have to think about these things. We can't just blindly trust everything that we see on the internet. Reading good. Support reading programs in schools. Support humanities education in schools. Fund humanities and reading as well as STEAM. Fund everything. <laughs> At the time Matt Leacock was working on designing this incredible experience, I bet the thought never crossed his mind about how the situation that you play through in this game would pan out if medical professionals who take on the responsibility to treat patients on the front lines, especially like the medic or the quarantine specialist, were not given access to the basic resources they need, such as personal protective equipment or PPE, in order to keep themselves safe. Or what it would be like if there were large groups of non-playable characters just meandering around the board, representing parts of the general public who refuse to take health advisories seriously. I'll admit I haven't played Pandemic Legacy yet, so some of those mechanics might be present in that version of the game, but I doubt it. Under normal circumstances, these what-ifs would be thorny thought experiments to wrestle with in order to engage students 
in very complex and difficult discussions involving civics and ethics. But as anyone knows, at the time that this episode is coming out, these are no longer hypotheticals anymore. We are actually living through this kind of situation right now. So we have to take the time with younger generations to have difficult discussions about how do we get in this mess in the first place and what can we do? What is within the realm of human possibility that we can do to ensure that this kind of crisis never happens to us again? We have to learn from history. We have to learn from our mistakes. Otherwise, next time we could be playing a most dangerous game where the difficulty level ends up spiking well beyond our control. On that somber note, thank you so much. Really, thank you for watching this episode of Engage. I know it was a bit of a long one, and due to the fact that life ended up imitating art coincidentally, I know the subject matter ended up being a little heavier than I was planning on it being. But it just goes to show you, as I mentioned earlier in the episode, that sometimes when leveraged properly, we sometimes need games that help us to confront and deal with harsh realities. Games have the power to offer so much more beyond the fun and escapism that they're most famous for, because games offer safe spaces for people to be able to explore and experiment and analyze and reflect and we've really barely scratched the surface, guys. I have so much more to share with you guys that I've been planning on for so long. And so I hope you'll subscribe because there's so much more coming your way. And please share the video on your favorite social media platforms using the hashtags appearing on screen as it really does help the show a lot. I'm sure you hear that all the time from your favorite YouTube personalities, but it truly does help promote the show. And frankly, you never know how you could change someone's life for the better just by getting their hard work in front of the right pair of eyes and ears. More on that in a future vlog. Now, under normal circumstances, as I wrap up another episode on a fine example of a tabletop game one could leverage in your classroom, I would encourage my fellow educators out there to support your friendly local neighborhood game stores by talking to the game store owners to see if they might cut you a deal in order to obtain several copies of the game for use in your classrooms. Obviously though, at the time of quarantine, at the time that this episode is coming out, that may not be a realistic option given the situation. So I would, at least in the meantime, encourage everyone to find other creative ways to support your friendly local neighborhood game stores as they certainly need our support right now. Perhaps you can buy a gift card from them or something. Additionally, I am well aware of the fact that I happen to be releasing this new episode toward the end of the school year, so my hope is that any educators who are out there watching will take this and other episodes to come over the summer as inspiration for what you could do in future school years. And for anybody who's interested in giving this game a try during our time of quarantine, there are digital versions available either through Steam, for Windows or Mac, or through iOS and Android. For whatever crazy reason, there's no online multiplayer mode for any of the digital versions of Pandemic as far as I've been able to tell in my research. But since it's a cooperative game, it is screen share friendly, so do with that information what you will. Lastly, if you're watching this episode at the time of the COVID-19 crisis and you're wondering how you could support our medical professional heroes out there who are risking it all to put themselves out in the front lines to fight this virus, I strongly encourage you to visit getusppe.org. Even though the infamous curve may be looking like it's starting to flatten, the virus is still as vicious as ever, and many of our doctors and nurses still do not have access to the personal protective equipment they need in order to keep themselves as safe as possible. Keep in mind, by the way, that just because the data is showing that the curve of confirmed cases is starting to level off and starting to flatten, that does not mean that the highly contagious nature of the disease is somehow magically gone away for either us or for any of the doctors and nurses and other medical professionals out there fighting to save people's lives. So please, if you can, if you're able to, help those doctors and nurses and other medical professionals out by visiting getusppe.org. 
And of course, if you're anything like me and you think that it's so incredibly sad and ridiculous that a relief effort like GetUsPPE.org even has to exist in the first place, well, the best way I would say to you if you're over the age of 18 to help in the long term in this crisis is to please check if you registered to vote at vote.org slash am I registered to vote with little hyphens between all those words and think very critically about who you're going to support in November. Whew. All right. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for watching and for sharing this episode of Engage, where learning through play is the name of the game. Stay safe, stay home, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Ba la 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 la